Good morning and happy Sabbath. I want to welcome those of you here and at home to basic training. Today we're celebrating something that Jesus instituted before his crucifixion. That's how long this ordinance of humility has been established. And the question we're dealing with this morning is, is it possible? Is it possible? Our scripture reading this morning is found in the book of Mark. Go there. Mark chapter 9. I'm going to stay there the remainder of the sermon. I'm not going to go and teach today. Today is a sermon for you to think about it. Mark 9, and beginning in verse 9. And this is what it says. You're reading with me. It says, and as they came down from the... Come on, talk to me. Come from the... Yeah. He charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen till the Son of Man were risen from the dead. You see that there? Look at verse 10. And they kept saying with themselves, questioning one with another, what the rising from the dead should mean. Let's pray. Father in heaven, speak to us, O Lord. In Christ's name, amen. I need your imagination this morning. The morning sun was rising over the sky in Jerusalem. Jesus and three chosen disciples had been on the mountain the entire evening. And as the sun arose, Jesus and his disciples began their descent. And based on what they saw the night before, Peter, James, and John were very quiet. They kept silent because... They were thinking about Moses and Elijah appearing before their master. They thought about what they have actually heard that night. They recalled hearing the voice of the father saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. But the disciples did not understand the meaning of the scene on that mountain. Once again, they reverted to the thoughts that Elijah had come to announce the Messiah's reign and that the kingdom of Christ was about to be set up here on earth. A kingdom that will overthrow the Roman Empire. They failed to understand that before the crown, I need you to listen to me, before the crown, there must be a cross. And that's the scene as we pick up now in verse 9 of Mark 9, where it says, hey, they, they, they came down from the mountain. He charged them that they should tell no, no man the things that they have actually seen till the Son of Man was resurrected from the dead. And they kept this, it saying with, to themselves, questioning one with another what the rising from the dead should mean. What do you mean the rising from the dead, Master? What do you mean don't tell anyone? And I can see the disciples confused and perplexed once again about what the master is asking them to do. I can see Peter just bursting at the seams, wanting to tell someone about Elijah and Moses. I can see the sons of thunder just wanting to take credit for being witnesses of such a scene. But Jesus did not want these three disciples to tell anyone about the vision that they saw at the Mount of Transfiguration until the day that he would be resurrected. You see, there were reasons as to why Jesus allowed these three to, 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 to play and see the scene that they actually saw up on that mountain. Friends, we need to understand that um, Peter, James, and John, only these three of the twelve were prepared to receive what Jesus was imparting to them. See, the fact that they were, they, they, they were to remain silent until the resurrection implied that at that time, at that moment, the other disciples were not ready to understand. And that their faith, their what? Their faith 
which would be failing at the death of the master would be and could only be strengthened later by the account of these three who witnessed such a glorious event. And I want to ask you something this morning. Does not Jesus still do the same inside his church today? I mean, we're talking about basic training, right? We're talking about committing to, to work for the honor and glory of God to grow this church. But how many times has Jesus provided some of us with the privilege of witnessing something that reflects his awesome power and control? And Jesus does, does it for others to be strengthened by what we have experienced and now we are sharing with them. Do you understand that the things that you go through is not a coincidence? Somebody is going to be blessed by them? Friends, Christ knew that these three needed to see Elijah and Moses. These three needed their faith to be renewed. And I beg to say this morning that we all need our faith renewed. They see, these three needed to believe his words about the resurrection about, uh, and provide faith and courage to their fellow disciples. You see, some of us don't understand that Christ allows us to go through trials inside the church so that our faith and courage can be strengthened. You know why? Because we still don't believe that what Christ is about to do. And Christ finds us asking, is it possible? Can it be done? See, we don't believe in what Christ is about to do through us. We don't believe in what Christ is about to do through this small church. And like the disciples, we find it hard to conceive the idea of a coming Savior. Hard to understand the idea that this world is going to end. But before all of that, some of us will go through these trials. Like the disciples, some of us will go through tribulations. Some of us will suffer for his name's sake. The disciples were still blinded by the popular concept of a Messiah as a conqueror. Instead of rejoicing at the fact that the Savior just told them, I am going to rise from the dead, but their hearts were filled with sorrow. And many of us do the same thing. We're still blinded by the many things that are happening to us and all over the world. And instead of believing the Christ, instead of clinging to the promises of the Bible, instead of trusting in the power of the Holy Spirit, we become so filled with sorrow that we start coming up with ways to help God in the way and the manner that it fits our lives. The way that we understand things should be. Folks, when are we going to understand and realize that God does not need our help? We concentrate on what we are doing instead of what he is doing for us. When are we going to understand that God is in control of everything? I say amen for you. Amen. The earthquakes, the hurricanes, the tornadoes, the floods, the fires. God is in control. He's allowing these things to take place for us, the people of God, to realize that Jesus is coming soon. And instead of, I don't rejoice in death. I don't rejoice in calamity, but I rejoice when things are happening because it tells me, hey, I'm coming. Folks, we are more concerned about who gets elected president than we worry about our relationship with the king of kings. Come on, somebody. When are we going to realize that God is in control of that too? God is going to put and take away whoever he, God, feels is going to actually fulfill his purposes. And don't be fooled about it. The president cannot fix the problem that we're in right here. No, 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 no. Only God can fix our problems. 
Some of us don't understand, and worse yet, we don't want to understand that point. See, the disciples still did not understand that Christ must die and rise on the third day. Do, do you understand that some of us may not be here to see the second coming, but one thing is for sure, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now, the focus of the story is not the three. The focus today is the other nine. You <laughs> see, I, you thought I was going to talk about the three. No, 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 no. Mount of Transfiguration, you already heard that. I want to talk about the nine that stayed at the bottom of the mountain. As their master and the three disciples were actually descending from the mountain, they noticed a large crowd surrounding their disciples. But Jesus was not all concerned about the crowd. No, no. He was concerned about the perplexed faces of those which were actually approaching him. He was concerned about the, the troubled expressions on the faces of his disciples. See, something must have happened which caused the disciples to suffer some kind of um, disappointment or humiliation. And this is where we pick up the actual story in verse 14. It says this, and when he came to his disciples, he saw great, a great multitude about them and the scribes questioning them, right? And then he says in verse 15, and straightway, that means immediately, all the people, when they beheld him, they were greatly amazed and running to him, saluted him. Something terrible must have taken place for, the, for, for it to be an argument with his disciples. What's going on? Why, why all this commotion? But as the Bible always does, it is, it's a dramatic change of scenery. Notwithstanding the hot temper that was happening just before him, the Bible tells us that all the arguments cease when the crowd saw the masters and his disciples approaching. And the crowd is like, what in the world? And it gets more interesting because we are told that night communion, the whole night, you know, before heavenly glory, have left its trace upon the Savior and his companions. Upon their faces was a light that awed the crowd. And the Bible tells us they were amazed. And they could do nothing else but to be quiet. And all the scribes, all they had to do is take a step back. And then in verse 15, this is when Jesus asked in verse 15, he asked, what question you did, you did with them? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I brought unto thee my son, which has a dumb spirit. Verse 18, and wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth, and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away, and, 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 and spake to his disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. What? You see, I can just imagine, you know that, that, that mom face when she's completely disappointed, that, that I'll get you at home kind of face? I can imagine that expression out of Jesus, the face of disappointment towards his disciples. I can imagine the disappointment and sadness that he must have felt in his heart. And Jesus immediately read the unbelief in their hearts. And, and as he exclaimed in verse 19, listen, because here comes the humility portion today. Oh, faithless generation, how long? Shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. How long shall I bear with you? How long? Friends, we need to be re reminded that these were the same disciples that were walking with Jesus every day. These were the same disciples who witnessed his miracles and his expressions of love. These are the same disciples who were given authority over unclean spirits. Jesus had sent them with authority to do just 
what his father has requested, this father has requested of them. But there and now, there appeared to be a difference on these disciples. What's going on? As they went forth strong in faith, when Jesus actually sent them to preach the gospel through Galilee, the evil spirits had obeyed their command and left. But now, as time had gone by, even when these claimed in the name of Christ, as they commanded the spirit to leave, the demons only mocked them with a fresh display of evil power. Friends, the disciples failed to understand that when they walked in faith, everything was possible. Amen. But when they don't walk in faith, is it really possible, Lord? Can we really do this? So when Jesus arrived at the foot of the mountain, all he found was nine faithless disciples. And it begs to ask the question, isn't that the same kind of faithlessness Jesus finds in us? You see, because, because you see, if the disciples were unbelieving, then how much more was the crowd? You see, that's why I have been telling you that, that we ought to be examples in our community. We ought to be a beacon of light shining upon a hill. We should all be full of faith and courage because we serve a risen Savior. And when we do that, when we reflect him without a single word coming out of your mouth, people just actually stare at you and say, there's something different about this person. But look at verse 20. Jesus now takes charge of the, of the situation and orders the child to be brought to him. And then in verse 20, and they brought him unto him. And when he saw him, when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, right? And he fell on the ground and wallowed foam. See that? And he asked the father, hey, how long ago since he came on, this came unto him? And he said, of a child. So from childhood, he has been like this. And then in verse 22, it says, And oft times it, it has it cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Forgive me if I forget about you right now because this is, getting, this, this is better than a soap opera. Because look at verse 21. In verse 21, it says, when the people brought the child, Jesus said to them, show, uh, to show you how much control I have over the situation, he starts with a very common conversation with the father. Hey man, how long has it been like this? You guys read the Bible too superficial. Huh? I imagine, here's a child foaming at the, he says it, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus is like, hey man, how long? And the father is like, come on. Come on, do your work. Come on. No, no, no. He's like, how long has it been like this? The child is foaming at the mouth. And Jesus turned to the father. Hey, hey, what's going on? And what happens next is incredible because when the Savior's eyes fell upon the boy. <laughs> Folks, when, when the, when the, let, me, let me come down. When the Savior's eyes fell upon the boy. The evil spirit could do nothing but cast him down on the ground, and now the battle lines are drawn. The prince of life and the prince of the powers of darkness meet face to face before this unbelieving crowd. And I can just imagine, you see, I have a great imagination. I can just imagine that the angels of light and the host of evil angels unseen, uh, uh, but to this crowd, waiting in anticipation of what is going to happen in this confrontation. And, and, and for a brief moment, Jesus allowed this, the evil spirit to display his power. So, 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 that, so that those who were actually observing could then understand the magnitude of the deliverance about to be brought to this ailing boy and his father. And I can see in my mind's eyes, 
the multitude is looking at Jesus, right? His beautiful countenance as he, as he addresses sin, ahead, you know, head on with mighty power. And Jesus turns to the frightened father and says to this simple words found in verse 23. If you, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believe. You see, there's no lack of power on the part of Christ. You understand that, right? There is no lack of power on the part of Christ. The question then becomes, will the Father have enough faith? Will we have enough faith? Will we have the faith when it comes to our jobs? Oh, Mario, right now there are people who actually work with me, watching right now. They work for the federal government. They do not know where the next paycheck is going to come. But I'm asking them today, will you have enough faith in our God? It, it may not be the job that you wanted, but it's the one, the one that you need. Will we have faith when things are not right at your house? Will we have faith when our relationship with our parents are crumbling because our decisions for Jesus? Will we have faith when your spouse is lying in a hospital bed in pain? Will we have faith when our marriage is falling apart? Will we have faith when the church has done you wrong? Will we have faith that God will provide every need inside and outside the church? Amen. Will we go from is it possible to it is possible? Because everything is possible for them who believe. See, the reaction of the Father should be our reaction. All the time, every day, every hour, every minute. You know what it was? And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my own belief. Help my own belief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge you, come out of him and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him. And he was as one that was dead in as much that people were saying, he's dead. But then Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up. And he arose. Amen. Folks, as the multitude, looking at him, it's like, oh man, he's gone. I don't know what this Jesus is doing. Jesus takes the boy by the hand, lifts him up at the feet, and presents him in perfect soundness of mind and body to his father. Amen. Can you see him? I, I can see the multitude in amazement, joining with the father in praise. And hallelujah! And I can also see, though, the scribes defeated, turning away from Jesus. Two kinds of people in that scene. Seeing the same miracle, but their reaction is different. How many of us have not cried out this poor father's prayer? If you can do anything, Lord. Have compassion over us and help our own belief. And that's our prayer in this communion service. And our Savior lovingly answers, if you can just believe, because all things, all things are possible to those who believe. Friends, it is, a, it is faith that connects us with heaven and bring us strength for coping with the powers of darkness. Don't you get that? Do you understand that the biggest weapon the devil has is fear? Fear. This cannot happen. This cannot be. What? All things 
can happen to those who believe. You know, we're told that in Christ, God has provided means for subduing every sinful trait and rest, resisting every temptation, however strong. But many that they lack faith are therefore they remain away from Christ. Let these souls in their helpless unworthiness cast themselves upon the mercy of their compassionate Savior, look not to self, but to Christ. Amen. Friends, the same Jesus that healed that sick boy and cast out his demons is the same Redeemer today. You see, in this story, we see Peter, James, and John experience extreme glory when they witness the transfiguration. But they also saw the remains, the, 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 the remains of extreme humiliation as their comrades have failed in their faith. On the, on the mountain, they saw heavenly messengers and even heard the voice of the Father. But at the foot of the mountain, they saw unbelief as the devil took hold of a living soul. That's a lesson to us today. See a glorified Savior on the top of the mountain, but at the foot of the mountain, we see him stooping down to save a lost soul. When that boy got what was sore, Jesus must now deal with these poor, downtrodden disciples. You see, they have failed to restore the boy to his father. They have failed to show the multitude the power given unto them from above. They have failed to show even a, a, a mustard seed of faith. Why? Because the selection of the three to accompany Jesus, we're told, to the mountaintop have brought some kind of jealousy amongst the other disciples. Why them and not me? Does that sound familiar? Because it sure sounds familiar to me. He doesn't have a doctorate in ministry. How can he go preach everywhere? She doesn't have a bachelor's degree. How can she gain so many souls? This is the mindset that clouded their true objective. You see, self got in the way of reaching out to the lost soul that was brought before them for healing. And they were so involved in their own discouragement and personal grievances that they missed an opportunity to witness as to the power of the Almighty God. So they came to Jesus. I love the disciples. <laughs> and they said to him in verse 28, <clears throat> And when he has come into the house, his disciple asked him privately, why could we not cast them out? If I was Jesus, well, dummies, no. Jesus then said unto them, This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. Jesus gave them the answer. One, one that they did not necessarily actually wanted to hear because we don't want to hear when Jesus calls us out. You see, Jesus is telling them what they need to do. You must give up something. Something that you adore. No, 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 no. Something that you think you would die if you give it up. Something about this earth. This earth. Something that may seem like a loss to you, but Jesus knows better than you what you need. And G Jesus told them, listen, listen, Jesus told them that in order to succeed in such a conflict between good and evil, in the daily conflict between good and evil, in the daily conflict between good and evil, in order for you to bring peace to those afflicted like that poor young boy, you need to come to the work assigned when, with a different spirit. 
a spirit not filled with self, but filled with selflessness. Uh-oh. See, because we always want to take credit. Look at what I did. Look at what I have actually done. Jesus don't want to hear any of that. The disciples needed to be strengthened through fervent prayer and fasting. But folks, don't come praying and fasting if you still believe that you can do it on your own. See, the disciples needed what I call a humble pie. Humiliation of the heart. The disciples needed to be emptied of self and they needed to be filled with the spirit and the power of God. Don't we need the same? Have you allowed jealousy, strife, conflict, disappointment to stand in the way of serving God? Have we been emptied of self? We went through the whole Holy Spirit series talking about this. This is the problem. We say hallelujah during the sermons, but are you really living it? Do we seek the Lord's will in fervent prayer and fasting daily? Do we? Friends, I'm here to tell you that we have to exercise faith as Christ describes it to, the, to his disciples. We must take hold of God's word. And, and we must preach and teach and baptize all nations in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We must preach the everlasting gospel, the beautiful cross, the beautiful Savior. Savior. Uh, he rested on Sabbath. We need to preach that we are justified by faith. It doesn't matter what Satan throws your way. It doesn't matter how insurmountable it may seem. It will disappear before the demand of faith. Faith in the promise that he is with us always, even to the end of the age. Every time I stand up here, I'm nervous. But my Jesus is right here. How you doing? I believe that. I couldn't do this without him. But that takes faith. And all I have to ask is, Lord, help my unbelief. Help me. Faith in the sacrifice that our Savior made in that lowly hill called Calvary. Faith in the rest that he partook on the Sabbath day. Faith that on the third day, like he told the disciples, I'm going to rise from the dead, leaving that lonely garden to empty. Faith that we have a high priest in the heavens right now, huh? interceding for us before the Father. And that by his blood we are cleansed and found righteous. Hmm. And faith that soon, very soon, he's going to come again to take us home. Faith that one day every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Faith, is it possible? I ask you, is it possible? It is possible. Let's go, Sister Barrow. Let's finish this up right now. Tess was a precious eight-year-old. When she heard her mom and her dad talking about her little brother, Andrew, and all she knew that he was very sick and they were completely out of money. They were moving to an apartment complex next month because... Daddy did not have enough money for the doctor bills and for the house. Only a very costly surgery could save Andrew now, and it was looking like there was no one to loan them the money. She heard Daddy say to a tearful mother, only a miracle can save him now. Tess went to her bedroom and pulled a glass 
jelly jar from its hiding place in the closet, and she poured all her change out on the floor and counted it carefully, three times even. There was, there, there was no way to mess this one up. There was no chance of making any mistakes. She carefully put the coins back into the jar and twisting the cap, she slipped out the back door and made her way to the six blocks to the Rixali drugstore with a big red Indian sign on the front, on the front door. And she walked patiently to the pharmacist to give her, you know, to get some attention from him, but he was too busy at the moment. Tess twisted her feet to make, you know, some noise, nothing. She cleared her throat with the most disgusting sound she could actually, you know, muster, no effect. Finally, she took a quarter from the jar and banged it on the, on the glass counter. That did it. Um, what do you want? Asked the pharmacist. Um, I, I'm, I'm talking to, you know, I'm talking to my brother from Chicago. That's what the pharmacist is like. I'm talking to him right now, man. Can you see I'm busy? I, you know, listen, I, 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 have, a, I have a problem. I, I, I want to talk to you about my brother. And, and, and he, he's really, really sick. And I need to buy a miracle. Beg your pardon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. His name is Andrew, and he has something bad growing inside his head. And my daddy says that only a miracle can save him now. How much does a miracle cost? Well, honey, we don't sell miracles here. I I'm sorry, but I cannot help you on this. And listen, listen, I have the money to pay for it. And if it's not enough, I'll get the rest, and you just tell me how much it is. And the pharmacist's brother was a well-dressed man. He stood down and asked the little girl, what kind of miracle does your brother need? Well, I don't know. I just know that he's really sick and mommy says that he needs an operation but my daddy said I cannot pay for it and I, 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 I want to I wanna use my money to pay for his miracle. Well, how much do you have? Oh, well, I have $1.11. And it's all the money that I have but I promise I can get some more if I need to. Well, well what a coincidence, the man said. $1.11 that's the exact price of a miracle for little brothers. So he took her money on one hand and grabbed her hand with the other. And they says, take me where you live. I want to see your brother and meet your parents. Let's see if, if, if we have that kind of miracle that you need. That well-dressed man, this is an actual true story, was Dr. Carlson Armstrong a surgeon specializing in neurosurgery. The operation was completed without any charge. And it wasn't long until Andrew was home again and doing well. Mom and dad were happily talking about the chain of events and that led them to that place. That surgery, her mom whispered, was a real miracle. I wonder how much it would have cost. And Tess just smiled. Because she knew exactly how much a miracle cost. One dollar and 11 cents plus the faith of a little child. How's your faith this morning? See, this is the deal now. This is the humility portion. Has your faith been getting weak because of the things that are happening in your life? Through all your struggles, through all the pain, through all the hassles and everything else, you even questioning, can this really happen? Is it possible? It is possible. All you need it's your faith. Do you really believe that God is in control? Do you really believe that God can change things? I mean, do you really believe it? 
Because our prayer today, as we partake of this communion service, should be, Lord, help my unbelief. Help me. Because all I have is one dollar and 11 cents and the faith of a mustard seed. That's all I have. And I can just hear my Savior saying, everything is possible for those who believe. Do you believe this morning? Amen. We are now going to go ahead and go through our communion service. But before we enter this solemn service, I always explain what we are doing. The Seventh-day Adventist Church practices open communion. All of you who have committed your life to the Savior, to, the, you know, to this mighty God, you may participate. You may feel that in your heart that you're not a servant of truth and, or holiness, but you may wish to take part of the service. You are not forbidden to do so. The first thing that we do is the ordinance of humility or foot watching. Foot washing conveys a message, a message of forgiveness, acceptance, assurance, solidarity, primarily from Christ to the believer, but also between the believers themselves. This message is expressed in an atmosphere of humility. After we finish the foot washing, we come back over here and conduct the Lord's Prayer. Now, the Lord's Supper, I'm sorry. As you come in, the actual deacons are going to actually, uh, they, you may not be seated in your place right now, but they're going to seat you in a, in a way that we can facilitate us for us to go through all of the aisles so we can provide you with the bread and the wine. Now, the Lord's Supper, that's a service, is just as holy today as it was when it was instituted by Jesus Christ. Jesus, we are told, it is still present when the sacred ordinance is celebrated. Folks, we have prepared two classrooms, or three, three classrooms on this side, so you're going to make it right here. We're going to make it another right. Just follow the deacons, all right? And then an immediate left, our, you know, our host is actually using the fellowship hall. So please, when we actually stand for the hymn of separation, on the third stanza, we're actually going to stand up and separate, right? But I need you to do so very solemnly and very reverently. Amen? We want to make sure that that remains in this place. Because today, all things are going to be possible to those who believe. Amen?